Ready. It's recording. All right. Hey, good afternoon. And uh, this will be the Bible study for this Sunday, uh, April 19th. Hope everybody had a good Easter, blessed Easter Sunday. And remember, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hope we're all staying uh, healthy and uh, looking forward to getting back to seeing you at some point. One of these Sundays, um, our family's all doing well. Um, I had no responses about doing a Zoom uh, video meeting, so I'm just going to stick with the video format like I've been doing. Um, you know, and this seems to work out the best for everybody, and so we'll just stay with this for right now. Um, so here's an opening prayer, and uh, we'll get started. So, dear God, we come before you this morning, and we thank you for the blessings of your son's life, death, and resurrection, and that our souls are saved through his suffering. We pray for our dear sister Florence and ask that you would heal her and restore health to her body. Send the Holy Spirit upon me as I put these notes together and let us all remember that as Paul says, your grace is sufficient for all my sins. Amen. So I'm going to do this this week and next week. And then, you know, we'll see what happens that first week in May. I may consider seeing if people want to come over and sit on my back porch, um, you know, maintaining their you know, distance or whatever, doing it that way, or if you'd rather continue, you know, doing it over the internet, if you feel safer and more comfortable doing that. Um, but for the next two weeks, for sure, I'll, I'll send out the video. So we left off in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, and uh, we'll start out with verses 12 through 15. So it says, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. <clears throat> I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So, if you remember back two weeks ago, there was a section of scripture there in Second Peter where it's talking about assurances of salvation. And I talked about, you know, growing in the faith. And I used the example of how I had to grow as a college football player I had to, you know, get better than I was in high school. And so this scripture kind of goes back and attaches to that. Uh, Peter's reminding us of what he spoke about in the previous section, that if you grow in your faith, your trust in the Lord Jesus and keep the faith. As he says in verse 10, you will make your calling and election sure. He's also letting the readers know that he knows you know this, right? He's saying that, that we are, we're already firmly established in the truth. He's talking to a group of people um, that they are mature in their faith. These are, these are believers and that he's writing this letter to that, that are past the milk stage, right? They're eating solid food. He also, in verse 13, basically tells uh, that he's going to continue to remind them as long as he lives in this earthly body. And I love that he calls it a tent, right? Because that's basically what it is with the soul sleeping inside it, right? And I keep kind of going back to this point, and I think it's really important right now, you know, during this pandemic that we understand as Christians that, you know, worst case scenario, I mean, if we get sick and, and our physical body dies, that that that's, I mean, you know, yes, it's going to be hard on the people that we leave behind. Uh, you know, none of us, you know, wants to die. But the reality of it is, is that the soul is the most important thing. We've got to keep, you've got to keep coming back to that, that our eternal soul is what this is all about. And the physical body ages, it breaks down. You know, it doesn't last forever, right? But that soul does. So, you know, I love that he calls it a tent because, uh, you know, like it's a great analogy. Like when we go camping, we sleep in a tent, right? Kind of protects our body or shelters our body, just like this physical body kind of shelters our soul. In verse 14, he also reminds us that Jesus made it clear to Peter that he's going to give up his life in service of the Lord. And Peter, in fact, was crucified. Right. So he Peter, you know, Jesus told Peter, you know, that was going to be the cost of following him. And and Peter is actually crucified. So, you know, that Peter understands that this is going to happen. In verse 15, he also kind of lets us know why he is writing these things down so that after he is gone, we'll always be able to remember them. Right. And again, 
you know, it was easy for for the disciples that had been with Jesus, maybe even for the first generation after him, you know, because the stories were firsthand, those emotions were so deep. It's kind of like I talk about being a baby boomer. You know, my parents tell me stories about the Depression, about World War II. To me, they're pretty real, right? I tell them to my kids, you know, they're, you know, they take them with a grain of salt, two grains of salt. By the time they tell them to their kids, it's almost like, you know, you're, you're making it up, right? And so that's why, you know, Peter wanted to write these things down to remind us, you know, 2,000 years later, that, um, you know, this is a direct account of, of someone who witnessed Jesus living on earth, right? So the next section of scripture is from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. It says, we did not follow cleverly intended, excuse me, invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father, and then the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him, and I am well pleased. Excuse me, this is my Son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. I apologize. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So in verse 16, it says, it indicates again why I think it's such an important book. This, this book of First and Second Peter, these, you know, kind of to a lot of people, it's, you know, it's the Gospels, it's the Paul's letters, it's Revelation, but they, they overlook these other little books. And, and First and Second Peter, we've, you know, these, been through this. This is a tough, I mean, these are meaty scriptures. Because Peter was a first-hand witness to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. He's the first disciple to actually enter the tomb on the day of the resurrection, right? Even though John outruns him, Peter goes in first. He's one of the first ones called, right? In fact, in some some of the uh, accountings in the gospel, Peter is, is called. You know, some, I think the Catholics believe that Andrew is the first one. But, you know, Peter's certainly one of the first ones. Peter walks on the water for a few steps, right? He has the faith to get out of the boat and try it. He's the one who draws a sword in one of the gospel accountings to, uh, and cuts off the ear of the nephew of the high priest or, you know, somebody that was there trying to arrest Jesus. And uh, he does follow at a distance after the arrest. Now, yes, he did is deny Jesus, but he did follow, right? So you have to be there in order to deny. If he'd have just gone home and dent his sheltering in place of his uh, kind of thing or whatever, you know, he wouldn't have been able to deny Jesus. So he had to have followed him. So this is, you know, Peter is like one of the, the you know, the rock. I mean, it, that's what Jesus says is the rock upon which I'm going to build my church, right? So he, along with some of the other disciples, were present when they went up on a mountainside. Jesus took a few of the, like the inner circle, I guess is one way to say it. And uh, up to this mount where they had this transfiguration, and they hear this voice, right? And it says that God was well pleased with Jesus. Now imagine if God said he was well pleased with us, right? I mean, you know, that would sustain me for the rest of my life if I, if I got that, you know, voice from heaven saying, Hey, Randy, you're doing a good job. Keep it up, right? And so that's, that's what happens here. In verse 18, Peter is reminding us that they all heard the voice, right? It wasn't just his interpretation, you know, or whatever, somebody else's memory, recollection, or whatever, that all the people that went up there heard the heard the voice. So and it appears in three of the Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So this is, you know, pretty much for sure that, that this incident occurred. And so that's why this is in this scripture, and it's just a reminder to us again that you know, Jesus is the Son of God, right? It says in verse 19, so the next section will be verses 19 through 21. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God 
as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it's interesting here in verse 19, Peter is letting us know two things. One, that it's okay if we don't just take his word for it, right? That that even though he's Peter, he's he, like we talked about, you know, the first or one of the first disciples, part of that inner circle or whatever, he tells us, right, that, that it's more than just the word of a man, right? That when the prophet speaks, we don't have to just take his word or take, take the prophet's word for it. But that we should also believe because the prophets of the Old Testament let people know many years beforehand what Jesus' life and death would be like, right? There's a, you know, before Peter was born, before he was a disciple, before Jesus was born, the prophets were talking about this, right? So Peter just kind of, he solidifies or, or um, you know, personifies, brings into life what the prophets were talking about. He lets them know that the scripture will be like a light shining in a dark place. And it will be like the morning star rising in our hearts, right? That, that's some of that great figurative language, right? That we can all kind of picture that light shining in a dark place. It, you know, if you're, I had an opportunity, the girls and I and Jen, we went camping up in uh, Kings Canyon and we went to the Boyden Cavern. It's a cave there and you can pay your six bucks or whatever it was and go back into the cave and you get in there about 50 yards or so and it's, they turn out the lights and it's just like pitch black. I mean, you can't even really imagine how dark it is in there. And then, you know, they turn a the light on and for a moment or two, it's, it's just blinding right? It's a, so you can kind of have that vision of that light shining in a dark place. And it's also kind of telling us like with that morning star rising in our hearts that we can feel the scripture inside of us, right? And it will cause changes to us. I mean, you know, doing this Bible study with you guys on Sunday mornings and, and, and doing these uh, videos, I mean, I come out of here fired up, right? Because, you know, I'm really having an opportunity to like really dwell and think about you know what we're talking and I and I go through and I do the writing for it and then I and then I recite it to you or whatever it's like you know it it I can feel it alive in me okay and it says in verse 20 let us it lets us know that it was never the prophet or just a man who inspires or writes the scriptures but it's God speaking through the Holy Spirit right and that Holy Spirit speaks to that man who writes it down it's important that we understand this when people question us about the Bible, right? You hear this all the time. Oh, it's just a book, right? It's, you know, it's it's this or that. It's a man's interpretation of something that happened or stories that were recounted from, you know, or whatever. Like it's, you know, almost like a folk tale or something, right? But we need to remind them that it might have been a man who actually like put the ink on the paper, but it was God speaking through the Holy Spirit, okay? And it's important as Christians that we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God and that it's useful for teaching and you know proving things right or wrong or whatever if we have kind of a laissez-faire attitude about the Bible then you know you, you need to like kind of get yourself get your act together because the Bible is is the infallible inspired word of God right and it's not just some book so you know, as, as Christians, that's kind of part of that maturity thing, right? When, you know, when you first, when you first become a Christian, maybe you, you know, you read the stories and it's like, wow, that sounds cool. Or, you know, you're a little kid and you hear the story about Noah and his ark or whatever. And, you you know, and then you, you go to school and they tell you, well, it's impossible. Nobody could have done that or whatever. But we need to, we need as Christians to make sure that we accept that the Bible is real, right? And the Bible is the word of God. So before we begin chapter 2, so that kind of wraps up 2 Peter chapter 1, right? So before we begin chapter 2, I want to make sure all of you understand <clears throat> that there are few, if any, people in the Bible who are spoken of so poorly and so much promised bad things to happen to them as false teachers. Chapter 2 is all about false teachers, false prophets, and what's going to happen to them, right? And chapter 2 is not going to be a happy... You know, where you're not going to get warm, fuzzy feelings, you know, reading chapter two. Okay, this is this is kind of like letting people know that if you're leading people astray, if you're a false teacher, a false prophet, uh, there are going to be serious consequences for you, right? So, so chapter two, we're 
you know, we're going to strap it up and, uh, and, uh, you know, talk about, you know, who you shouldn't be, I guess, right? A false teacher. So one of my favorite verses from the gospels is in the book of Matthew. And Jesus tells, uh, tells some of them that if they lead the little children astray, it would be better for them to have a large rock tied around their neck and be thrown into the ocean. And I used to always tell the kids when I was teaching class, right, or coaching a sport or whatever, the kids I had on my team, I'd say, hey, look, I'm going to be judged in heaven by how you turn out, right? As a teacher, I'm, I'm held to a higher standard. God expects me to be steering you in the right direction. So, you know, uh, chapter two here is, is going to be, you know, it, it's, it's going to be pretty direct and pretty blunt. So just be ready, I guess. Okay. So second Peter chapter two, verses one through three, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them being bringing swiftly destruction on themselves many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute in their greed these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping right so this is kind of the opening salvo you know for those of you that didn't have that military background right this is kind of the the, the first the first shots being fired here to let you know what's going to happen if you uh, are a false prophet so it's a great opening paragraph for chapter two it gives you a little background letting you know that there have always been false prophets and false teachers among you right if you remember the book of acts i can't remember the guy's name but there was some guy that kind of ran around doing magic tricks and then he he sort of um uh you know became you know a believer but he wanted uh, Paul to give, or Peter to give him the, this power, or maybe it's Paul and Barnabas, I have to go back and relook, but to give him this power so that he could, you know, perform these magic tricks, not because he wanted to like, you know, spread the gospel, but because he wanted money, right? He wanted, he wanted to make money off, off having this power and stuff. So, they, you know, they've been around forever, uh, maybe just telling one or two other people. The problem is, so you think, okay, like, I'm going to do, you know, I'm a false prophet. I'm a false teacher. I'm just going to tell one or two people to do this, right? So those one or two people tell one or two more people. Those one or two people tell one or two more people. So now you've geometrically multiplied the number of people that are hearing this thing. He even indicates that people will deny the Lord, even though Jesus bought and paid for their souls, right? That's some pretty good wording in there. And in verse 1, it says, the Lord who bought them, right? I know Pastor Mike, Pastor Rick, they always talk about, you know, that the redemption, the redeeming, right? That, that they had, that like a price had to be paid to redeem someone from, you know, slavery, from sin, from those kinds of things. And so, you know, it talks about Jesus bought and paid for their souls, right? With his death and resurrection, and and the punishment that he took, right? We all, we often sometimes we think it was just kind of, you know, you just think about okay, he got he just got crucified. As bad as that would be, but you know, the flogging, the everything that went on before the crucifixion, you know, even though it's graphic and you don't like to think about it, that's part of that price that was paid, right? So Peter should know a thing or two about denying the Lord, right? He's got a little experience there. Peter also puts my mind at ease by letting us know that that the these people will meet with a swift destruction, right? Verse 2 tells us the real problem with false teachers is that they lead people astray by their shameful ways and bring the truth of gospel into disrepute, right? They, they cause people to fall away and they also then cause other people to not follow the God or, you know, to hear the gospel or to follow God because that they make up these stories. They, they do these things that, or they, you know, they, they commit sinful acts. And as a result of that, people don't trust the word, right? That it becomes in, it, that's what disrepute means. It means it's like that, uh, people don't believe in it, that it's, uh, that it's got a bad reputation, right? So I always talk about, you know, 
you don't want to have a reputation for being a person of ill repute, right? And and so disrepute means like if false teachers make it so people won't believe the gospel or that people think it's false or that, you know, and that's that's one of the real reasons they're going to get punished, right? So think about people, you know, I'm just thinking about like Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, right? That's kind of from my era. I remember back in the 80s, they were, you know, they were that gospel of wealth kind of thing and you know had the jets and the you know all the fancy cars and everything and people were sending them money like it was going out of style right but you know they do a lot of damage to people who are uh you know truly of the faith right that's a bad you know they 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 do a lot of damage to the gospel a lot of people won't listen to you because of people like that you know, for those of you that are a little older, also you remember Jim Jones, right? And and the cult kind of thing, you know, and those people down in Jonestown that drank the Kool-Aid, you know? And so again, that re religion sort of gets a bad reputation. It becomes a disrepute because of things like that. Peter uses the word shameful, right? I love the connotation of this word. Remember, connotation is not, not the dictionary definition, but what we think of when we hear the word, right? Shameful. I mean, I just think about, I mean, like, shameful is something, you know, I, well, I'll, I'll share with you. It says, like, I think of something embarrassing and something that my mom would have, you know, said, you're an embarrassment to the family. That's, you know, that's shameful. You so said, think back when you were a kid, there was, you know, and, and I'm from the era when, I mean, I, I got spanked with a belt, <laughs> you know, and other things like that. You know, um, no punishment was worse, though, when your mom told you you were an embarrassment to the family. You know, go sit in the corner. You're an embarrassment to the family. You know, and, and and that's kind of what I when I think of shameful, that's what I think of. I did something to shame my family. You know, that was just really bad. So in verse three, we learn of the motivation of the false teachers. Right, one of the oldest yet strongest motives in the book: greed. Right, the teachers will exploit you because they are greedy. They want money and power. Never forget that the love of money, the Bible says, is the root of all evil. And that scripture also tells us that you can't serve both God and money. Sometimes there's a there was a weird word they use there called mammon, right? And it's basically refers to money, possessions, all those different kinds of things. But Peter does give us some assurance when he tells us that their condemnation is hanging over them and that their destruction will come, right? Maybe not as fast as we would hope sometimes. Sometimes we just wish that bolt of lightning would you know, take care of business. But we tend to see things again from our earthly perspective of our bodies, our homes, our finances. We want we want revenge and we want it to be immediate, but we have to remember that absolutely God will, you know, if it's you know, vengeance it says, vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. If if vengeance is required, he'll get it. We also have to remember that God did not create us to to condemn us to hell. Right? He would he would hope that everyone would come to salvation and so maybe the reason some people don't get it right away when we want them to get it is that you know maybe at some point they're gonna come come around right and we're all just saved sinners you know maybe we didn't murder somebody but our sin is just as you know great or whatever we always have to remember that our bodies are not the most important thing i just gonna i'm gonna keep harping on that during this Bible study, our eternal soul is, and since it's eternal, it can be more patient, right? Maybe our bodies, maybe we can't be quite as patient, but our souls can, right? Because they, they have forever. We look at minutes, days, hours, weeks, years, things like that. Our soul doesn't really count time, right? I mean, if you think about it, you still remember, I mean, even a person who's 95, 100 years old, you, you have flash memories of your childhood. You, they're, they're, you maybe remember a Christmas or an Easter or, you know, a, a birth of a baby brother or sister or, you know, something from when you were a kid. I mean, I, you know, I'm 57. I have pretty vivid memories of some of the things that I did in childhood. So that, that soul is eternal it's it's time frame is entirely different and i think if we start to kind of think like that then we understand it's a little bit easier to be more patient we need to start looking at things in god's time you know which is which is eternity right so and i always come back to this thought right this is the bottom line do i trust god or don't i 
right? This, you know, it's like I can I can talk all I want. You know, it's like it's always say it's it's your actions, right? Actions are more important than words. Do I truly trust God? So I say this prayer sometimes when I'm starting to get frustrated about different things. I'll say, Jesus, I trust you for the forgiveness of my sins and by extension, the salvation of my soul then. I trust you with my finances, my health, my children, my marriage, my life with the coronavirus. I, I trust that you, that you know what you're doing better than I do, right? And we either believe that or we don't believe that. There's, there's no gray area there. And this, the nice thing about these, this First Peter, Second Peter, James, these, these books that we're studying, there's no shades of gray, right? You either are on or you're off, right? And I kind of like that. I'm a, I'm an A or B guy. So, next section is Second Peter, chapter two, verses four through ten. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, sorry, if he rescued Lot, sorry, not Rot, Lot, a righteous man, who is distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men. For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Right? That drives me nuts sometimes. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. And we'll come back to that in a minute. That's pretty cool. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature. A lot of times we think of the, the word they use as the flesh and despise authority, right? So this is, it's an interesting section here because he's talking about, you know, the, we talk about the cause and effect or the if and then, right? In, in, in math especially, right? Or sciences, things like that. So if God didn't, spare these people or if God did spare this person or if God did this then there are consequences right and so you know that that's what's talking about here it's like you know God did all these other things so we need to believe then that these ungodly men are going to get punished right that they're they're, they're going to get what's coming to them and especially if they follow the the desires of the flesh right and despise authority that's an interesting one. We'll come back to that, too. So the beginning of this scripture might shed some light on the controversial scriptures, controversial scripture we read a couple weeks ago about Jesus preaching to the imprisoned spirits, right? And then he makes it clear that angels who rebelled at some point before and were cast out of heaven and imprisoned. You know, there's, there's allusions in the Bible to, you know, these battles that occurred and that you know, the angels and, and then the fallen angels, the demons and the devil and stuff, that there was some spiritual battle and some of them were cast out. Um, I know that that uh, epic poem, Beowulf, that the kids read, you know, there's there's some illusions. Uh, illusions not the right word. Um, there's some connections there to this idea that there was some great spiritual war in history where, you know, some of the powers of uh, darkness were cast out of heaven right and so you know that that's kind of what this is you know talking about here it says again check out some of this figurative language and i know several of you are old english teachers or ex-english teachers so words like gloomy dungeons right and hell right we have connotations of that word great for creating a picture of despair and sorrow he reminds us that the ancient world was also destroyed by a flood right saving only Noah and his family and the animals. We should mention that the animals get saved because again, as it said in Genesis, Noah was considered to be righteous, right? It, it talks, talks about that in this scripture, right? When I hear that word to me, it means someone who is right with God. If you're righteous, his or her soul is, I like to say, in tune with God's will, right? And God holds them blameless. It's not holy, right? There's a difference between righteous and holy. Because I believe only God alone is holy. 
but it's kind of maybe like the earthly equivalent, like maybe the best that we can do as a man on earth is to be righteous. He reminds us that Sodom and Gomorrah, <clears throat> two of the most powerful and majestic and most technologically advanced cities of the ancient world, were burned to the ground, right? And Lot was rescued for being a righteous man in an unholy land. I love uh, I'm a big Indiana Jones fan, and, uh, and then the uh, Last Crusade, I love that quote, you know, we're pilgrims in an unholy land, right? And so, you know, Lot was like a like the lone good guy uh, in a sea of bad guys, and that would, that would grate on you. That would be so tough, right? Talk about stressful situation now. If you were the only good guy in a world of bad guys, your life would not be fun. But Lot, you know, God rescues him. But also, you know, his wife turned and looked back to see the city or whatever, and she gets turned into a pillar of salt, right? Because there, there's there's always that if and then, or that, you know, you weren't supposed to look back. You looked back. Here's the consequences, right? So um, were the false teachers and prophets. Okay, so, so Lot was rescued for being a righteous man in an unholy land. But these false teachers and prophets are going to get what's coming to them, right? It's interesting that Lot's plight is mentioned here and that he was tormented. And I, I think of when I hear that word tormented, heart sick kind of comes to, that's the connotation for me, by the evil he saw around him every day. And again, listen to some of these adjectives and figurative language, the filthy lives, right? Think of the connotation of this word. What do you think of when you hear the word filthy lives? Right? I, I think of some pretty bad stuff. Right? But verse 9 is a real comfort for all of us because Peter reminds us God knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to punish those who are ungodly. And this is exactly what he will and intends to do. Right? But maybe not as fast as we want, maybe not when we want, but again, we have to understand that it's his timing, not ours. Right? That it's not about me. But, you know, that it, it, that's this is a real positive in here that that if Lot could be rescued from Sodom and Gomorrah being the one good guy in a, in a sea of evil, then there's hope for us. Right. It's also good because for the part of me that likes, uh, you know, Rambo, uh, you know, killing the bad guys hard or whatever. Uh, I love it. It says to punish those who are ungodly, uh, that they will get the double whammy. Right. They're going to be held for judgment. And they're going to continue their punishment on earth. And I'll come back to this in a minute because I think that's really interesting. Verse 10 tells us who is going to get it the worst. And it's those who desire the flesh or follow the desires of the flesh and who despise authority. I don't think he's saying that we can't disagree with our leaders, right? Or that we may want, you know, to change a policy or regulation or we have votes. We, we, we vote somebody else out. We vote somebody out of office, bring in a different person. Sometimes, you know, it may be time for a change. I don't think that's what he's talking about with despising authority, right? It's the idea that we're not going to follow the rules of society. Um, and we're not going to follow the one true authority, which is God, right? That if we despise authority, it's like, we're not going to listen to God. We're not going to you know, we're beyond being told what to do, even by him, right? So if we despise, okay, another another word for despise is to hate authority here on earth. How can we honestly feel we will submit to God? So let me go back to this point about, uh, you know, that they're not only going to get punished at judgment, but they're they're getting their punishment now at the same time, Right. There are a lot of wicked people who appear to prosper on earth. People say that all the time. How can this guy be prosperous? He's, you know, he's, the, the, he's, he's slime or whatever, right? But that may, you know, appear true on the surface. But if you, you know, you look deeper, most of the, you know, a lot of rich, famous, most powerful people that appear to have it all are some of the most screwed up people on the planet, right? Their, their children are in and out of rehab they they've been married and divorced five or six times you know they just they, you know because money can't buy you happiness money can't buy your health right cancer doesn't discriminate between a guy with 10 million dollars in his bank account or 10 dollars in his bank account you know like talk about with this disease i mean you know it's it's across all different socioeconomic 
groups, you know, maybe some are getting hit harder than others, but it's not like, you know, this group is not getting anybody infected and this group's getting everybody infected, right? There's, it's, it, it goes against all things, right? Money can't buy you love, money can't buy you respect. Now, some would argue that you can get respect from money, but I, true respect comes from, you know, believing that a person is like, there's like a loyalty thing in there with respect, right? That you really think this person is, you know, he, that, that, that there's something about this person that, that you really connect with on a personal level, you know? And so, yeah, maybe money buys you like, uh, you know, the respect in the sense that, uh, you know, people open the door for you or something, but true respect is, is earned through your deeds and actions and stuff. And the only thing that really matters is your relationship with God. And that comes through Jesus Christ, right? Those are the things that matter. So false teachers are going to get their punishment not only at the time of judgment, but in essence, a lot of them are getting it now on earth because they're, they're living lives that are so screwed up that they're screwed up, right? That's a, you know, I'm not an eloquent guy, so that's probably about the best way I can say it right there. So the next section of scripture is 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. Bold and arrogant, these men are not afraid to slander celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. But these men blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like brute beasts, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like these beasts, they too will perish. So in this section, I think he's comparing false teachers. And this is just my opinion, right, to these celestial beings. I think he's comparing them to demons and other false or uh, fallen angels and not in a good way. Right. Because, you know, they're willing to slander celestial beings, maybe slander angels, slander God, different things like that, despite only being men. But, you know, if you remember when a couple of times when Jesus cast out demons, you know, even the demons would not slander, slander Jesus. Right. Or slander God or slander his Holy Spirit. OK, but a false teacher will. That's kind of what Peter's saying here. These guys, their tongue, you know, we've talked about taming your tongue, but these people are willing to say anything about anybody, including up to and including angels and, and other things like that. Now, that's pretty arrogant, right? Pretty arrogant. He says these men blaspheme in matters they do not understand. Right. And I know Pastor Mike talks a lot of times, warns people about, you know, Hey, you, you, you know, you, you go take a look at this thing about black magic or witchcraft or devil worship or whatever, you know, and you think it's very innocent, but you, you know, you're playing with fire there. You're playing with things that, that are outside understanding, right? But a false prophet, false teacher might dare to do this, right? It's like we talked about that guy in Acts. He wanted this, this magic power that was coming from somewhere. He wanted it and uh, he was hoping that the, uh, you know, the disciples or the apostles there would give it to him. Right. Remember, Scripture tells us that when Jesus cast out demons, even they know not to mess with him. Right. And I remember the one about the pigs. Right. It's like, well, let us just go off into the herd of pigs. And then the herd of pigs runs off into the sea. Right. But they these these they know these celestial beings know that you don't mess with Jesus. You don't mess with God. Right. But a false teacher doesn't. He'll he'll take that chance. I love verse 12. The false teachers are compared to brute creatures brute brute you know uh um, animals kind of thing creatures of instinct born only to be caught and destroyed when i hear this my thought is you know so you're talking about animals that that just really serve no purpose and so we have to trap them and kill them you know um you know a man-eating lion uh you know wolves i mean i have nothing against wolves but if you're a rancher i mean the wolf you know that there's really you're not gonna you're not gonna break the wolf of the habit of eating the eating the animals right aggressive bears they always talk about that if you know if the bear gets that taste of human food even if they take it and dump it out in the middle of the woods somewhere a lot of times they end up having to kill those bears right i'm sure there's a lot of large birds maybe some of the predatory birds things like that who they get a taste for livestock or things like that and, and we just have to kill them 
right? Because there's no, there's no, you're not going to tame them in essence. So then think about a grizzly bear, remember? And, and a lot of you don't realize, but at one time, grizzly bears were all over the state of California. In fact, the last one shot in the wild in the state of California was over there in Mount Hamilton, just outside of San Jose. Can you imagine that? The last grizzly bear in California, just outside of San Jose. But we basically had to hunt them to extinction because that's what these things basically are. Now, I, I don't have nothing against grizzly bears. Don't get me wrong, but 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 they're 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 omnivores. They're 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 at the top of the food chain. They're they're brute beasts. They're they kill and eat and and you know that's that's their that's what they are, right? You're not gonna you're not gonna saddle it up and ride it, okay? And I know some of you will probably get mad at me for that, but I mean that's I. I'm sorry, but you know, you're not, you're not gonna, you know, a grizzly bear is not a horse. A grizzly bear is not a dog, right? A grizzly bear is a brute beast. So it's a killing eating machine. And, and to a large extent, the only thing we can do with them is trap them and, and destroy them. Right? I, I, I need to get off the grizzly bear thing before I get in trouble here. So, <laughs> all right. So second Peter chapter two, verses 13 through 16. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They had left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bor, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, a beast without speech, who spoke with a man's voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Now, I'm going to let you read about that story because, you know, we're cutting into time here. But the story of Balaam is in Numbers chapter 22, verses 22 through 35. But I want to address the description of Peter gives of who these false teachers really are. Right. They carouse in broad daylight. Right, so don't we generally despise people who drink during the day, right? We 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 look down upon you know somebody who's having you know drinking alcohol before a certain time of the day, right? They're we think of them as a drunkard carousing in broad daylight. Um, let's see, they don't work. We think of them as lazy, right? They're seeking pleasure when they should be seeking a living. Uh, he describes them as blots and blemishes. Right? And I think about it in your skin. What do we try to do with blots and blemishes? Right? We, we try to get rid of them. We wash them. We put medicine on them. You might even have one surgically removed by a doctor. Okay? So it's, you know, blots and blemishes are not things that, that we want. They revel in their pleasure while they feast with you. And the way I look at this is like, I think that means that they're going to smile at you. And when you turn your back, they're going to knife you in the back. Right. And I'd always much rather I'd tell the kids at school, I'd much rather have you look me in the eye and say, Mr. Logue, I'm going to stab you rather than have some kid smile at me. And then when I turn my back, they're going to do that. You know, so I, I look at that as kind of the difference between amoral and immoral. Right. These people, you know, I believe Peter is saying that they are amoral. They have no morals. Right. Immoral is just the other side of the coin means they have bad morals or their morals are they're always geared towards evil but an amoral person they feel nothing they don't you know no, no difference between right and wrong to them all right they have a wickedness in their eyes have you ever seen an amoral person it's a craziness they never stop sinning they seek the weak unstable you know, okay people and this is how cults work right they go after people with low self-esteem and things like that they're experts in greed. They want to know how they can benefit from somebody else's sorrow. You know, and sad as it is, there are some people right now that are trying to benefit or prosper from this whole situation, you know. And again, I love the prayer of Jabez. We did the Bible study on that one. Um, you know, it says, help me not to do evil, but deliver me from the evil one. Right. Jabez prays that out. And I always add a little extra sentence in there for me and my prayer of Jabez that uh, and help me not to derive pleasure from someone else's pain right because that's what that's what these false prophets do right they're they're getting pleasure from somebody else's pain these evil doers peter describes here are seeking not only pleasure from others pain but i also want to financially gain from that 
right? And think about our man Peter's description, an accursed brood, right? That's what he calls them, an accursed brood. Those three words say it all. So the bottom line is, don't be a false prophet or teacher, because if you are, you're an accursed brood. All right, so we're almost there. Uh, next section, chapter 2, verses 17 through 22. Got to get a little water. It's warm today. All right. These men are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. That's a great quote right there. Right? It's not just a slave like you've been you know, bought and sold and chained up. Okay, you'd be a slave to football. You could be a slave to food. You could be a slave to some kind of substance, right? If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. That's a big verse too. It would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. And again, we're definitely going to do Proverbs, right? A dog returns to its vomit. Think about the, you know, you can picture that in your mind right there. And a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud, right? So it's really a, a great way to finish this out here. It says, wow, there are too many scriptures in the Bible or there aren't too many scriptures in the Bible that drop the hammer like this one. Peter really does a great job of explaining the dangers here. He's basically saying that they prey upon people who are just coming out of darkness when they are most vulnerable and that they take advantage of the situation for their own personal gain, right? Could be money, sex, power, etc. right? So if somebody's just recovering from something and one of these false teachers, false prophets, false saviors, in essence, kind of steps in during that period of time when these people are vulnerable, right? That's, that's what he's talking about here, right? Um, great language, again, in the first section of the scripture, they're like springs without water. What good is a spring without water, right? Think about you're crossing the, the, on a wagon train and you come to the spring and there's no water there, right? And the next one isn't for whatever, 75 miles, what good is it going to do you? Blackest darkness reserved for them. Empty, boastful words. I think we can all picture those things, right? It's another good figurative language. Verse 20 is a warning to both them and us that if we escape the world by the grace of God and then go back to sin, we are worse off than if we had never you know, been saved, right? It's like, I was talking about like, you know, watch an extra inning baseball game. Like, let's say your team is ahead in the ninth inning and the other team ties it, right? So you go extra innings and then your team gets ahead again in extra innings and then the home team wins it in the bottom of like the 12th or something. It's like losing the same game twice, right? So that's, that's what he's talking about there too. Um, Let's see, I lost my spot. Worse off than we've never been saved. At least before, we might have been able to plead ignorance, right? If we've never been saved. But after we know the truth, we had better expect an even harsher judgment, right? And listen to what the proverb tells us. It's amazing how many times the New Testament refers to the proverbs, right? The proverbs, proverbs, proverbs. About a dog returning to its vomit. It's not a pretty picture. We've all seen it, right? In the backyard, we never understood why, but dogs do it, right? Or think about the second one, a washed pig returning to its mud. And I guess the expression that even if you put a pig in a suit, it's still a pig, right? <laughs> you know. So bottom line, Peter makes it clear that false prophets, false teachers, teachers who have gone off the rails, are going to face a judgment twice as harsh as the rest of us. You know, so pray for me, right, that I don't, that I don't lead you guys astray or that I don't go off the rails here. And uh, I'll tell you what, that's enough for today. That's a, that's a pretty intense set of scriptures there. But I do want to conclude with something really bright, right? 
So, because, you know, scripture's like that. For every, for, you know, there's some, some harsh scriptures, there's some good scriptures. There's darkness, there's light. You know, the yin and the yang kind of thing or whatever. So let's think about John 3.16, right? One of the classic scriptures. So remember that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only or only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, right? And so it's important that if we only teach people like one thing, teach them that, right? That God so loved the world that he gave his only son and that if we believe in him, we'll have everlasting life. Right? And all the rest of this stuff is just, you know, helps us in our growth and helps us in our maturity. But but that's the that's the bottom line. Right? So I want to praise and thank God for that. And I just wanted to try to end that on a happier, more positive note. So, dear God, just help us remember that we should always seek to tell others the truth about you for your glory and not our glory and for your kingdom and not our personal gain and for the benefit of others and not ourselves, right? If we keep those things in mind, we'll be in pretty good shape. So, amen, and that's it for this morning. Um, we're, we're still moving along there in Second Peter. These are tough scriptures. They require a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of effort to uh, kind of uh, go through them and stuff. So, again, please, if you have questions, comments, disagree, don't like what I said, get get in touch with me i really miss having the group to like bounce things off of but this is you know what we got right now and uh, we'll do our best with it while we can so 